crypto markets struggle to gain momentum, even as US stocks make another all-time high. Geopolitics and the US election cast clouds of doubt over sentiment. And short-dated calls offer a very cheap way to play upside for those looking for that October rally. All this and a whole lot more in this week's Crypto Options Unplugged. Welcome back to Crypto Options Unplugged, everyone. I'm Imran Lager from Options Insight. I've got my man Dave from FRINT. And today is a very special episode. We've got the man himself, Raul Powell, from co no, co-founder and CEO of Real Vision in the studio. How you doing, Raul? I'm good. Good to see you. Yeah, it's lovely I'm... grey London. I'm so happy to be back. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, we don't all live in the Caymans, unfortunately. But, yeah, when, uh... when, when you turned up tan, I was like, oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> I did that on purpose just to piss everybody off. <laughs> and, and the white hoodie. Yeah. <laughs> At least you got to wear your hoodie, right? You probably don't wear that in the Caymans very often. Speaking of hoodies, speaking of hoodies, we're doing a, a giveaway again. You may have seen the giveaway we did a few months ago to celebrate this special episode. We're giving away two awesome Derabit hoodies. So make sure you like, subscribe, and comment with the hashtag Derabit giveaway. And then, um, you know, we'll announce the winner next week like we did last time. Uh, and we may also have another special guest coming in the studio today as well, Crypto Michael, although he's been held up a little bit getting here, but hopefully he'll make it into the studio. All right, boys, with that, crypto markets, they cannot get going. Where is this banana zone you keep promising us, Raul? I don't know. We were talking about it today. <laughs> I mean, everyone's just so frustrated with this sloppy price action. Yeah. Right. Equities at all time highs. The macro's good. China's stimulating. Everything's, everything is in place. You know, the pattern matching versus exactly what happened last year. Everything's in place and the market cannot get out of its own way. So what's, what gives? I what don't do know. And I was, you know, talking to somebody today who we won't talk about a uh, naming, but same questions like, what is going on? Who's... Is somebody selling? Is something? Is there a flow that we don't know about? This is what we've yeah, been we, yeah, we, we, we've discussed that for a, a few weeks now. I mean, there's clearly been this supply overhang, right? With, you know, you've had from the U.S. government, the German government selling MT Gox. You know, um, a lot of talk in the past week with with the China thing um, that you know Chinese retail selling out their Bitcoin and because now they've got another high vol asset to play in their own stock markets. So maybe we're just digesting this supply overhang. It's definitely, I've compared it to like the FX markets when, when I used to trade in those, where you kind of feel you've lined everything up correctly from a macro. And yet, and, and then you find out a few weeks later that there was some like M&A &A or something. Yeah, and you go, oh fuck, that's why, that's why we weren't trading. So it does feel like maybe there's a flow. Um, but if it's something like that, then this is like a golden opportunity, like because the election, there was also the argument that someone made who we got in the studio the other week was like, you know, do you want to take the career, career risk of owning it before the election? And then there's like a 20, 30 percent move yeah, well, for, for some reason. Like, wouldn't you wait until you get the all clear? You see the weird thing of micro strategies decoupling from Bitcoin, yeah, mm. which is equity flow versus crypto flow, which adds to this. There's something else going on. Mm. And then, you know, looking because I've got an asset management firm um, that invests in uh uh, crypto hedge funds and speaking to everybody there are no flows because everyone's waiting for the range to break mm -hmm. so there's all the family offices like well we just want to wait for things to start being confirmed mm -hmm. and it's the election you know we need we want to see what happens with the election it's basically everybody's waiting for everybody else and we don't really have a catalyst i mean all the catalysts are in place mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know what's left and 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 on that bro like, what are the sort of main sort of catalysts that you're looking at that still kind of keeps you in the banana zone world? Um, that well, we're I mean, about we to take produced up? something for Global Macro Investor two weeks ago, and it was it's probably 50 charts of liquidity, financial conditions, um, historical pattern matching, technical analysis, you know, everything from, you know, if you look at Bollinger Bands of, you know, volatility, you know, all of these things have always led to a big breakout. So you've kind of got every box ticked. I mean, everything. And, you know, China have started to do the whole global stimulus game and that will spread to everybody. 
Yes, at the end of the quarter, uh, the Fed saw a draw of liquidity because of the bank funding stuff, but that goes away. So I don't know. The only so thing for me, it's just a matter of time. It's just. But the way I see it, like the only, one of the big things that's changed from previous crypto cycles is we've got these ETFs that have brought in a bit of a different player, right? In terms of the investment in crypto. So is there something going on with like, we had this big re-rating in the first quarter because of the ETFs and the institutional adoption that everyone was expecting. And, and obviously there was quite a lot that was bought, right? And all those big new ETFs. That is now made this market kind of a little bit different to previous cycles, maybe? I, I think if you go down the list, it's really interesting. When you see the list of the biggest holders of the ETFs, mm. yeah, there's some RAA firms and whatever. Most of it is the converter ARP guys. Yeah. It's all of them are the ARP guys. So yeah. they're either ARBing using the ETF because they can get um, prime broking on it, which you can't get on Bitcoin very easily. So they use it for prime broking, and then they're arbing the futures or the perps. Right. Yeah. Uh, There's no actual real new money that's come in yet. Then. Yeah, so. there is some. You can go down the list, but yeah. when you look at it, it's all millennium. It's all all the same players, okay. and they're just extracting cash from the cash and carry. But then the guys that we were all thinking were going to come in and allocate into the space that who haven't already, does that mean they're still to come then? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just again the regulatory issues. I mean. Every week, there's somebody else being prosecuted. Then you've got the kind of Trump on one side, uh, the Harris administration not making it clear what they're going to do, and the mm -hmm. SEC being hostile. So that keeps people back from actually mm -hmm. really allocating. It's like, okay, we need election clarity now. That's why that's why long dated call options are like in demand all the time because it's only this is the only safe way to get access to that upside, right? Yeah, yeah. And is there a vol kink over? Oh, for you sure, know. for sure. There's been a vol kink in for the 8th of November. That's the uh, the expiry that they've listed for the election. There's there's a vol kink in the order of magnitude that they're implying about a 10 to 12 percent move on the day, right? Yeah, but what about afterwards? No, I mean the whole curve is, is higher. The whole curve is obviously higher, but there there's not like yeah the 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 vol market's not priced in a way to say oh for the end of the year. There's, there should be a load of extra vol premium beyond just what the election is providing, right? Because the other thing, I was speaking to another mate of mine who who runs a big macro book for one of the big macro funds, and he was like, same thing. He's like, there's no vol priced in for a Trump win, let's say, which is very positive for tech and crypto. Mm -hmm. And he said the other thing that's not priced in is a contended election. A contested election is not priced at all. I mean, it's not priced in the S&P. It's not no. priced in crypto. Totally agree with that. And I think that's a massive risk, by the way, because yeah. something, you know, when you've got people like Elon Musk and Tucker Carlson talking to each other with gazillions of followers each, right, and they're making noise about what, you know, voter fraud being so easy now, because in the US, you don't need ID to vote. And in fact, you're not even allowed to show your ID in the voting room, they're not allowed to look at it. That is the weirdest setup ever, right? So if Trump doesn't win, and a lot of people think he's going to get a landslide, but if he doesn't win, he ain't going down lightly, right? Because he's going to say that was uh, it was stolen, and he's going to have people like Elon backing him, saying it was stolen, and, and that's going to cause all kinds hope. of civil it's a clear unrest. Victory for whoever wins. Yeah. What yeah. we don't want is no, but that. all the civil unrest that could come from that. I mean, it's not being priced at all. Right. I mean, the irony when it comes to Bitcoin is, is I always say like Bitcoin for me captures like both sort of tail ends of the risk distribution. And particularly it's like the hedge against the failure of existing economic and political structures. And for me, in a weird way, if we have that shit show, it's like I, I, I want to own Bitcoin more <laughs> than less. I think you're right. And often you might get a sharp sell off. Yeah. And then the yeah. screaming buy as everyone says, well, I just want to get out of this whole thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, interesting. What well, um, I, I guess one of the questions, like we, we're certainly in agreement in terms of the, the macro lining up, the liquidity cycles picking up, like every, everything just looks perfect. And and I mean, Imran, which makes me suspicious because we all think the same. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I tried to be devil's advocate when we talk every week. Yeah, like like Imran's always talking about you hedging. You're, you're hedging your downside. I'm like, <laughs> look, it's up only. We're October. But like, what what where where could we be wrong? 
and, and what, what risk for you, you know, out there, outside of there just being a flow dynamic or someone blowing up, where, where, where could we be wrong on this? It's if the liquidity picture <clears throat> doesn't match what we're all expecting. You know, the, the general thesis that I brought about was the fact that we need to refire the debts and that liquidity has been cyclical and it's been measurable and we've got a huge amount of debt coming. Yes, GDP growth is decent right now, so that does pay for a lot of those interest payments, but interest payments are very high. So for some reason, not only the US doesn't provide liquidity, because if you go back to the 16-17 the bull run, the US had raised rates once, went on pause, didn't do anything with liquidity, the Chinese did it all, and then the UK because of Brexit. And so it'd have to be all of them not doing anything. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese have really made it clear they're yeah. going to have to do something. So that's the difficulty I see is, is I don't see how nobody's going to do it. Because mm. inflation's imploding in Europe right now. It's just the Europeans are going to keep going. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. That's the only thing I can see is for some reason that whole liquidity story, the cyclicality doesn't work. But it's been working perfectly yeah. since the bottom in 2022. Yeah, yeah. And really, when I look at the patterns and stuff with GMI, it's like I'm complaining because it didn't match last week. Versus, <laughs> yeah. You know, mm -hmm. really, with a bit of wiggling around because of flows or whatever, whether it breaks out this week or in two weeks' time, three weeks' time, makes no difference. But it, it should be that order of magnitude in terms of time. It's like it's right here, right it's now. Time, yeah. And is it yeah. a case of the dominance that we've seen in Bitcoin I mean, is that still at the highs? I think it is, given where ETH is, right? Do you expect the first leg to be led by Bitcoin because of the election and, and no. stuff or not? No, I think everyone's looking for the confirmation of Bitcoin mm -hmm. and then everybody's going to get out the risk curve. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because look, if we've got the banana zone, everything's going to rip. Everyone knows what the game is. You want the beta. Yeah, everybody's going to want the beta. And, you know, so where do we're we get already the beta? seeing it. You can barely keep memes underwater. Well, memes yeah. are going, yeah, and but you can memes are going. Stuff like Sui, you just yeah. can't keep these things down. Yeah. So you can see that the market's kind of getting ready to do all this stuff. And mm. the moment Bitcoin breaks 70,000, I mean, God, these memes are going to go ETH, bananas. ETH's been a dog, though, right? Like, ETH has really suffered. I mean, Solana's looked better than ETH by a long way. Are you still, because you've you've historically been a fan of ETH, are you still a big, fa big fan of ETH? I'm gonna, Look, I love ETH. It's it's great. My only ETH exposure is NFTs. So I've got a lot of high-end NFTs, which are only on ETH. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'm a mercenary otherwise. It's like, you know, what's going to outperform? I've been Solana, mm -hmm. and then I've been switching towards Sui, even though I'm on the foundation, so I've been granted tokens, but I've actually been buying in the open market because the chart versus every cross rate versus Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, and choose your token and it's about performing. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, this is the signal that this may be the next chosen one. Mm -hmm. um, ETH, I've been thinking through what happened with ETH. So the layer twos obviously took away from the layer one. Okay, fine. But what I'm thinking is really being built is something that scales much larger by having the layer twos and then they're going to go to this ZK roll-ups, whatever it's going to be. But they have a roadmap. And I think basically they've overbuilt infrastructure um, for where we are right now. And that's what it is. While Solana and Sui and other stuff are seeing the pickup in activity, ETH has basically built out enormous amount of block space. And as the market grows, I think, you know, ETH, because it's security and all of the other stuff, will attract more flows. Mm -hmm. But it's probably going to underperform this cycle. Underperform Solana, but I still think it outperforms Bitcoin. I look at that cross a lot. That cross perfectly works with the ISM. So as the business cycle picks up, that's alt season. Now, why is that? It's pretty simple because everyone has a bit more money. Yeah. Because as soon as the ISM picks up, still below 40, 40 uh, below 50. So this is, it actually says a big part of the economy is still slow. And another part is racing ahead. <laughs> so that means that corporate earnings are still slow. That means people's paychecks are slow. That means that bloke who owns the sandwich shop down the road earnings are still a bit slow all of that stuff mm -hmm. when it starts picking up that compounding effect of the business cycle means more disposable income means 
more investing and mm -hmm. then people go out the risk curve. So we still haven't got to that point. So we're still, and that's another reason maybe this whole breakout from the banana zone hasn't happened. Is it really happens when the RSM crosses 50 to the upside? Mm -hmm. That's like a big signal. One, one thing I'd, I'd question on the whole Bitcoin, you know, leading or not question is if Trump does get in and, you know, we've heard about this talk about a Bitcoin strategic reserve, right? Like, do other central banks start putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet, right? Does it actually become a strategic reserve for other countries because the U.S. Could, well, uh, well, endorses it? Why does the U.S. need a strategic reserve when it's the world's reserve currency? <laughs> it's nonsense. <laughs> It's just Trump making Trump sounds. There is <laughs> no reason. You are the world's reserve currency. Mm. The US doesn't even talk about its gold holdings. It's just, it's a legacy thing. But you are, but you've got trillions and trillions of debt. And is that not a way of basically saying, you know, don't don't abandon the dollar because we've got reserves in gold and we've got reserves in Bitcoin. The, the right? world is, is so indebted dollars that they're, it, dollars always in short supply. Yeah. So anytime yeah. the world slows yeah. down, the dollar goes up. Anytime, you know, it's just, there is a desperate need for dollars. I mean, mm -hmm. what happened yeah. to China? They needed dollars. What the US did was agree via Japan intervening in the currency to um, inject dollars back into the Chinese system. Yeah. So I don't think that they need to do anything. And the argument, oh, well, you know, look at the size of the debt. No shit, Sherlock. We know what they're doing. They're debasing the currency to pay for the debt. Yeah. That's the privilege of having the world's reserve currency. You can force an 8% annual purchasing power depreciation via debasement, which is basically, I think of it as a put option on implosion. So I don't know what you'd pay for the option, a put option on, let's say, equity markets falling 50% plus and most markets falling apart. That's what, if you get the, big reset, the big, you know, mm. thing. Okay, that's what happens. Well, what we're doing instead is we're basically paying them to take away that downside mm -hmm. or an 8%. By debasing option. money. Yeah, it's yeah, an option yeah. cost. Yeah, it's quite an expensive one as well, right? It is, but, you know, I'd rather pay 8% than I would to see markets down 80. And it's 8% that you don't actually see yourself paying. No. You see it as, as an asset inflation, basically, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Your future self gets poorer because you can afford less with your income. I was, I was thinking about this, actually. <clears throat> when I first bought my flat, a first flat in London, I think it was like £265,000 back in like 92. And I was thinking my salary was probably 70, 75. Mm -hmm. So that so was five, five or maybe my salary was 80 or 90, whatever. It's about three and a half, four X. Yeah. 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 That same flat is probably one and a half, two million. Wow. Well. And I don't know, a two bedroom flat in Bayswater on a, you know, on a nice square. It's probably not far off that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the average kind of 20-something investment banker earns as they're starting their career now, probably 200. So it's gone 10x. Yeah, yeah. And that's debasement. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's that's where you see it. And um, I mean, it's funny, like with, with London Crypto Club, and our, our first ever kind of um, piece that we wrote to kind of lay out the macro landscape for all this stuff, there's there's kind of no getting away from it. The the dynamic plays out, and like you can be off with timing and stuff. And I know like you, you you've done some great work around like the refinancing cycle and all that stuff. But but there's there's just with these fiat debt driven economies, there's no way of them sort of getting out of it. And and like 08 was the big reset, and you know they they chose to reflate the assets right because that's the collateral that underpins it all. Like. There's, there's no way they get out of that. There's no kind of magic cure. Yeah. May, maybe some productivity growth from from AI and all that stuff, fine, that makes it more affordable. But where we are right now, they're going to continue to debase. What, what, one one thing I wanted to pick you up on, actually, was on the dollar. Yeah. Because uh, Imran and I was having this conversation just yesterday, actually. Um, I, I, I'm never too bearish dollars because, like you say, there's like a what, 17, 18 trillion dollar short out there by virtue of the, the amount of dollar-denominated debt um, issued outside of the U.S., and I, I always think we go through these cycles where basically Fed start hiking, like dollar rips. Uh, the moment they even whisper about hiking, dollar rips against everything, dollar wrecking ball, all that. Um, and then and then we kind of get towards the end of that cycle, rates peak out, dollar starts to, to sell off a bit. Um, and then you have a bit of dollar weakness, but then and then the Fed start cutting, which is kind of where we're at now. 
But then when usually when the Fed are cutting, the rest of the world's in more shit, yeah. which we've seen in China, which we've seen in Europe. Um, and then a the dollar strength kind of plays through for a bit more. Um, and then we, we only then get a really nice sell off when Fed run things too low for too long. The world's reflating and that's like kind of um, that probably then runs until we get these dollar demise pieces. A, a question um, that comes to mind, obviously, I think a strong dollar has been negative Bitcoin. Can, can Bitcoin still go on this? And can we still have this banana zone if we were to see over the coming months? A really sort of strong outperformance of the dollar. I've gone back and tested it, and it, it can it can rally in any environment. Dollar bull markets, yeah. dollar bear markets. So, I mean, I don't think we're in a dollar bull market environment yeah. right now. Um, I think the dollar moved quite a decent amount. It got down to that hundred level. It's like no, thank you, and it's Phil, yeah. yeah, it was due about. It was and definitely you've due now about. got closing of positions and all of that stuff. And you know, currencies when they trend, they really trend. But also you get these periods of sideways consolidation or, you know, retracements that can last a while. So I don't see the conditions for a strong dollar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, as you said, there's this mismatch. And now everyone's like, well, the Fed can't really cut and everyone else is going to cut more. And then that narrative will change. So I just think it's kind of caught in no man's land yeah. right now. Yeah, I mean, the seasonality for the dollar is usually quite bad into the end of the year, just like it's quite good for, the, for crypto as well. Yeah. The other thing is interesting to me is the rates market is the rates market is like utterly convinced that rates can't come down and that every opportunity it sells off. But when you just look at the CPI prints, every single one is lower and yeah. it has been for two and a half years. And even the one that came out today, 2.4, it was like, oh my God, it wasn't 2.3. But then you look at the previous one, it was 2.5. It's like there's this disinflationary trend, but the rates market just doesn't want to believe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I mean, I'm interested in your thoughts. I've got so many people send me the chart of 70s inflation. <laughs> I write that in GMI every month. I put that chart up <laughs> as a joke to show how often it's been posted. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and like, um, I mean, Lynn Auden's like written some really good stuff around um, comparing actually more to the 40s. I think you've, yeah, you've kind understand. of written about that as well. Um, are, you, are you still of that view? There's, I mean, I mean, we put... Uh, Julian Patel and myself put up that chart of we call Mount Fuji, which is all of the five <laughs> major inflation yeah. inc incidences. It's exactly following that. It's a normal disinflationary process after a sh spike of inflation driven yeah. by a supply shock. The post-war period was identical. Um, so the only one that was different was the 70s. And, you know, there's this whole group of people who just want to believe in that rates should be higher, everyone should pay the price, the market should collapse, you should buy gold. Right? There's a whole group of people who want their justice and they've been baying for it since the 90s. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And that's what the people posting that chart, when you actually go down and look at it, they're gold people. Yeah. So what happened in that chart? A lot of it say, well, it was Arthur Burns, he screwed it up. The reality was, it was, what, 1970. By 76, 77, we started getting this second spike, right? 74 was the first one. Well, that was the baby boomers hitting the workplace for the first yeah. time. Mm -hmm. It was a demographic issue. And that's what everybody misses every time. Yes, I'm sure there's some monetary stuff going on, blah, blah, blah. But really, it's so, a... It's so you're a saying it wasn't, it wasn't Burns as much? No, you had a, like a 20% of a population all coming to the workforce mm. earning money at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Of course you're going to put up prices. Yeah. I mean, everything goes, and that happened on a and, global and, and, you know, the force of AI is so disinflationary. It's oh unbelievable. Like, I mean, it's insane. The well, we, we, we had, um, we had Stefan Rust um, mm -hmm. from Trueflation in here uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. And like, true he's an inflationist. <laughs> yeah, he, he, is. he is. He's an inflationist. He is. But he, but true inflation right now, I think, has inflation around one point six or something like that. Yeah, so it went one, down to one point one. Yeah, yeah. Two weeks ago. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to love what he's doing. You've got to love what he's doing over there, though, right? I do. It's really cool. Yeah. But nobody cares. <laughs> and not that. Yeah, I follow it. But in the future, don't you think people will care? No, because governments want control. But but more and more people think the governments. Like they've always lying, thought that. Right. My entire career, they've always thought they're <laughs> yeah. cooking the numbers. Right. And they probably are. Yeah. But the problem is, is markets trade on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the question is, are markets ever going to care more about what Truthflation is saying than what the official data is saying? That's the question. And that's a hard call. And we've seen a lot of this kind of stuff in the past. Mm. Yeah, I love their methodology, but we've had the whole Harvard thing with a million prices. Mm. I want to be cared. I mean, just everyone's been like, we're going to expose the government mm -hmm. and how they calculate inflation. Nobody cares. Would you on on the inflation theme? Would you are you still leaning towards that 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 there's a risk that we go into a, a deflationary world or a, at least you I think know. the world is deflationary overall. Yeah. Um. What? Yeah, I think that that's the issue. Is the world is deflationary because of technology, because of an aging demographic. I don't see any reason why it's structurally inflationary. Mm -hmm. And when you look at you know we produce all of the demographic charts versus you know, long-term CPI, labor force participation rate, all of this, it doesn't stop. Yeah. Now, until the labor force participation rate increases because of AI and robots, which were too early for that yet. So I think that economy structurally changes, maybe 2030 onwards, we just we're in a whole new paradigm. Mm. But right now, all I can see is, is disinflation over time. I don't yeah. really see a difference. People are like, well, Immigration, the UK's just had its largest increase percentage-wise of immigration in history this year. How can that be inflationary? The US has had a huge Im influx of, of immigration. Before, there was a bit of wage pressure because immigration, was t um, immigration policies were tight. But they've opened that. And then you've got technology. So I just don't see it. Yeah. And, and, and how do you respond to then... Because I, I, I completely agree and... and um think structurally we're still in this disinflationary world how do you respond to people that will say well isn't bitcoin the inflation hedge everyone confuses inflation and debasement yeah yep, exactly. yep. inflation is cpi which is the rise of goods and services um that is nothing to do with and this whole monetary inflation if they just stopped conflating the two things into one yep. they said there's inflation which is usually a cyclical phenomena mm -hmm. And then you've got an occasionally structural because of, let's say, population or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you've got debasement, which is a whole different game. Mm -hmm. And that's been going on. And the way I would characterize debasement and inflation is like, you've got different baskets. You've got goods and services that people consume, right? And if they get too expensive, it becomes political. And like what happened basically... And that's people's why... discretionary income goes down. Yeah, and you know, you know, the government who's in control is like basically looking bad because people can't afford to fill up their cars or go to the groceries or whatever. But the debasement, you, you see that in asset prices, right? Correct. The debasement you see in the big ticket, the houses, right? The stock market, you see that flying... And everyone's happy and smiling, but that is debasement, right? Yeah. It's not the same kind of inflation that everyone gets annoyed about that is going to get you voted out of power. No, right? but it's it's equally dystopian in terms of what it does to people, but yes. they don't see it. Well, yeah. the wealthy get wealthier and the poor are getting screwed. Yeah, and what it right? means is, you know, what is an asset? An asset is future deferred consumption. It's something you buy today. You get rewarded for locking up your capital mm -hmm. by excess returns. For the future and for that you can spend it in the future now what's happening is our future selves are getting poorer because you can afford less so investment banker you know 25 year old investment banker now can buy a fraction well he can't even buy the house because you can't even get the mortgage on it anymore so then you're missing out on that whole rung mm -hmm. and if you look at the stats of home ownership home ownership of 30 year olds it's collapsed if you compared it to 1983, um, all of the stats just show that that they're just going to miss out on a big part of economic life, which is why so many people are driven towards speculative assets because it's the only way of making it up. When you speak to somebody, I had this conversation today or yesterday, I'm like, you know, why don't you invest in the S&P 500? They're like, how much does it make a year? 8%. And they're like, I'm fucked. I'm never going to make enough money to retire or do anything. Mm -hmm. So... Therefore, you, they move to Bitcoin. Now what's happening, it's really interesting. Go and speak to a 33-year-old now and say, so, you know, I presume you're long Bitcoin for the crypto cycle. They're like, fuck that. 4X? Never going to make me enough money. I need to make 50X. <laughs> yeah. I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah. That's why they're like, all buying is... memes now. <laughs> and because they're all this cohort of which you're probably, how old are you? 
I'm 44, mate. Oh, yeah. yeah. You just look like a baby. <laughs> yeah. Is that real, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. Oh, you know, I, I'm flattered that you thought that. I, I would have thought you were dead in the middle of this cohort of like 35, 36. I wish. I wish. Imran's got a great skin routine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we should have a podcast about Imran's skin routine. That's much better. <laughs> Probably get more views. <laughs> you, you know, this is going to be the bit that's cut and fell out there, right? <laughs> be the highlights. Right? <laughs> All right, so, if you speak to these, the, the average millennial now, they're under pressure because they need, they're getting married. Some are having kids at the lowest rate in all history. And they haven't got a house, so they're trying to get a house. And so it's pushing them, as they get towards their 40s, that it's pushing them to become more speculative, not less speculative. It's mm. like, we, we need to move forwards with our lives. We need to keep pace. Yeah, with, with the the debasement. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of it is like it's, it's a little bit shit or bust for these people, right? It there's, is. Yeah, there's no um. Yeah, that's just. Well, the, the moment you save up, you know, in a year for for that deposit, then everything's fucking gone up. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, which is why I've always loved like Bitcoin in terms of. Yeah, yeah, like like I've, I'm still you know property fine. You know, property's gonna probably go up over time. Um, particularly you know we live on an island and and the debasement games. But again, you need a deposit to buy a property. It's expensive. Like, how how can you buy a, a fraction of a property? Whereas Bitcoin's is perfect. Just start, you know, start hedging yourself there at least. But and that's the other thing about Bitcoin is, is people don't really, you know, we all get so in the day to day stuff. Really, what we've created is a globally homogenous asset. Yeah. Right. You you were in FX markets. We think of like. FX is globally homogenous. It's not. Go to a rice worker in the Philippines. They have no chance of buying dollars or pounds or anything. Yeah. So it's not a product. Gold, yes, but the bid offer spreads are so massive. So what you, this is the only one, and it's fractionalizable. So whatever you earn, you can put ten percent of your income in. Yeah. Guys, That's good news. Yeah. Michael made it. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a little bit of musical cheers. We now got Michael in the studio with us. So Michael Van der Pop. Uh, founder of M N M Group. E M N Group. E M N Group. Yes, yeah, I knew I was going to mess that up, but <laughs> welcome. Thank um, you. So you're you're pretty big on socials, known as Crypto Michael. Why don't you tell us a quick, quick and dirty summary of how you got into crypto and what you're doing in the space now? Uh, well, eight years almost. Uh, started through just a drunk friend saying something <laughs> about Bitcoin on a Wednesday morning during class. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, I didn't pay attention to any of those friends and all. No, me, I didn't like my studies at all. But then, when he said something about Bitcoin in the week after my best friend showed me Coin Market Cap during the good old 2017 days, um, or beginning of 2017, I was like, okay, this is something for me. Uh, bought my first altcoins, went down the rabbit hole, uh, orange builds, um, got my off, and went full time at the end of 2017. Got my office at the old Amsterdam Stock Exchange where I started my own group. So we were the first few companies of crypto being there. Um, did that for six years, but uh, markets changed. So currently we are running a venture capital consultancy firm becoming a liquid fund and a marketing company. So all sorts of things. Nice. And you do a lot of um, summaries on, on YouTube about your thoughts on the charts, on crypto mm -hmm. and stuff. Now, clearly, we're, we're all raging bulls in here, right? No, there's no... There's no uh, there's no hiding that fact, but what what are you thinking about this um, October rally that doesn't seem to be happening? I mean, September was expected to be bad anyways, and it was pretty good actually. And now October is a little bit bad, but it's still the middle sort of of October. So, I mean, it's all expectations that people have that it's just going to happen again. But we've seen a lot of things that are different this cycle and the previous cycle. So, I mean, we're just in the range, and as long as we stay here, it's fine. We just shouldn't be breaking out downwards, and as long as we stay here and we start breaking out upwards, I think it's going to go fast. Yeah, but he's got a big... phrase for it anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Raul's got his banana zone hoodie on, so he's not going to disagree with you there. But I, I'm going to be the play devil's advocate and say that I don't think we get much of an October. I think the rally doesn't happen, doesn't kick off until after the election. And then when it go, when it kicks off, it goes fast. Right. So this is why I think options are quite a good way to play it. Obviously, cheeky plug for Deribit, but like options are cheap. I mean, Vol's been grinding its way down, grinding its way down. If if we have the kind of upside that you guys anticipate that we do have over the next, say, six months. Right. 
owning those sort of call spreads, owning out of the money call spreads in things like ETH and Bitcoin offer you such good leverage to that move. And you, you're getting like 10 to one type payouts on that stuff. So instead of like people, you know, people worry about people worry about being under allocated to crypto or whatever, or they've got to jump through all these regulatory hoops and stuff. I think owning it via those sort of upside structures is just a big snow. And we've seen volatility come down, like Bollinger Bands have come, got to the kind of super low levels. So that means we're coiling basically in price. And every time it's got to these kind of levels, we've seen price explosion to the upside. Um, and as volatility comes down, it just becomes super attractive in this kind of stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I trade a bit of options, um, not a lot, but I trade them on Dara a bit, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, look, everything is in place. The only thing that we, we were talking about this earlier, Dave and I, was like, the concern is we all think it's likely to break mm. to the upside yeah. and go fast. And the issue is, is where is the capital flow going to come from? Mm. So if we're stepping away and want to give ourselves a counter argument is everybody's looking at each other to say, well, when it breaks, the market's going to go higher because it's going to bring in all of the FOMO. But it needs to break higher to bring in the flow. That's right. That reflexive thing needs to start. And every time it's got to the top of the range, it's come back down. And now whether that's because of some flow we don't know, mm. FTX estate stuff or whatever it is, that keeps slotting at the moment it gets to the top of the range. But I don't know if the market, the crypto market itself has much dry powder. Everyone's all in and waiting. Yeah, that's right. It does need, to, it does feel like it needs to be new money, right? New money that wants to allocate to the space, but has been shy to do that because we haven't seen the price action that we were expecting, right? And it might also be like the options, for example, right? The options being uh, listed on iBit, for example. You've got this entire crowd of single stock option traders on NVIDIA and Apple. When are, they, when are the options being listed? I don't know, but I think it might be by the end of this year. I think they've been approved to be listed, right? So I think it's just a matter what of... What do you think? Well, I mean, it's like if you need to attract new money, there needs to be a narrative, hmm. which means that there are two scenarios. And in my opinion, the first one is we are going to have some sort of 1928, 1929 type of cycle where... We are all going to see the markets continue to go up while we just print more depth. Um, that is going to be allocated into crypto. That is one thesis, but probably that's going to stay into the ETF markets or into in institutional space anyways. The second thing is, is shit hits the fan. The rates need to come down and DeFi becomes more attractive. That's going to attract more institutions to alloc or yield hunters to allocate funds into the ETH ecosystem or DeFi in general. And that's going to spread through the markets. That's, I feel like if we get worse labor markets or independent of who's going to be elected for president, I think we just overestimate that entire event. Um, but from that perspective, we probably are going to get a lot more money coming into the markets. And I think each showed it a little bit after the previous um, um, FOMC meeting. We had 50 bips rate cut, ETH bounced up and DeFi woke up too. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we changed it a little bit and the rumors are that we are not going to get any rate cuts at all. I think that change is quite fast and that's where the actual money shift starts to kick in. That's how I look at it. Yeah, yeah makes I, sense. And, and and like, you know, like narratives are everything in, in trading, the mm -hmm. world of macro. And it is amazing how quickly, you know, you get the narrative shift. Often, often price go up is the, is the narrative shift or enough to trigger it. Um, and then, yeah, then all of a sudden people start rotating out stuff, coming in. Um, it's interesting the point you make on on the yield side of things because I, I, I actually felt when FTX blew up, I kind of had the view that and everyone said, oh, this is going to really slow down institutional adoption. But I kind of felt at that point, most people I was speaking to, they they understood Bitcoin and they, they knew the risk and this was just another centralized actor blowing up. Um, and we've seen it, you know, so many times in, in the traditional world. The actual thing that I thought was a, a bigger problem from in terms of slowing institutional adoption was we all of a sudden got got macro vol back. We got rates and FX vol and and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so there, there was fun. As, as soon as that volatility starts to die and it, it becomes a race to zero on rates and what have you, um, then, yeah, one starts going, right, where the fuck am I getting yield? Um, and, yeah, ETH starts looking, oh, that's what can we do around there? And, and the whole DeFi thing kicks off. Yeah, and we, we're back in that world again. So... Yeah, there's a few, um, depending on how the macro plays out, there's a few avenues. And there's also some random things like, 
Just keep your eye on stuff like Off the Grid, the new big game that's coming. Mm-hmm. It's on Avalanche. Okay, fine. Avalanche is not a chain that a lot of people use, but this game could be huge. That's a huge yeah. influx of people that we're not even looking at. And there's a bunch of the protocols who are building stuff like that. So it's like a mass market abstracted away use of crypto that drives on-chain adoption, underlying value. So I think that that's the other thing. It's not the obvious it will come into the Bitcoin ETF and then flow through the market. It could come from a number of different places we're not seeing. Don't forget, the, at the moment the business cycle picks up a bit faster, it's slow across Europe, it's slow in the US, the forward-looking indicators are showing it going up. I mean, that probably ignites meme coins and brings a whole bunch of normies into meme coin casino because it's it's just gamification of 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 attention and... Internet and internet memes. I mean, yeah. they get it. Yeah. And if their mates make, we've seen it before in every cycle, whether it's ICOs, or if your mate is making a 50x, <laughs> you are damn well opening an account and going to start trading because <laughs> you can't bet. I mean, the other day, Murad Mamado was right. making this pitch and he said, like, retail is only attracted to meme coins because people actually made it. And that's the same as with NFTs and with yeah. uh, ICOs, as you mentioned. How people have got rich, basically, yeah. for very little investment, right? Yeah, and because we were talking about this before, it's like the average millennial who's really the that and the the 20-somethings to 40-year-old cohort, you know, they can't afford to buy a house. They're behind in the economic cycle versus their parents. You know, they're starting to marry, have kids, all of this stuff, and they've got these stresses. And, you know, when you talk to them and say, you know, you should buy Bitcoin, they're like, I'm, I can only make Whatever. 4x. Yeah. yeah. They're like, I need to make 10, 20, 50x or I'm not doing but it. it. But it is. But the problem is they're relying on the whole greater fool thing, though, right? Like the only way you're going to make yourself rich on memes is getting in there early and then selling uh, it but, after the pop, right? I mean, meme coins for me, I stay away from them. Um, meme coins, you only hear the good stories. So even with Mudeng, a friend of mine had Mudeng on the wrong chain. Yeah. yeah. So there are like 50 different ones and only one gets as big as you see on the sexes. Mm-hmm. But for exchanges, it is where liquidity is at. And that's why everybody just jumps on those on those meme coins where every chain, even Sui and Avax and all those chains are making their own, I think Hippo it is, um, they have meme coins on the chain, which for me feels like we're at the end of the curve of meme coins. Yeah. For now, and then it switches and, so and it comes back point, later. To your point that Forex isn't good enough, that's why you buy options on Bitcoin. Because you might Forex <laughs> well, Bitcoin. Those, don't forget, those same people were the option traders in in um, tech stocks. Yeah. Right. So the zero-day option, it's all the same thing. Yeah. They've not had access to Two options. Op- that's what the iBits right, because, do, right? Yeah. yeah. And that will change the structure of markets because mm-hmm. then you can say, well, can I get the 20x out of yeah. Bitcoin options or do I do it from buying yeah. memes? That is, a flow. that is a flow that we might be underestimating. But speculation is rational when you understand people's economic pressures. I think there are two things when it comes to liquidity too. I think one is we underestimate China. I think that a lot of liquidity is coming from Asia where the expansion is happening, but China comes out of a rough period where currently it's pacing up again. And if you look at the data, usually if I wake up, I'm in Europe, you can see that the markets are going up. Europe is flat and in the US either goes up or down. It's just lately it has been going down. So Asia is probably moving the markets. Europe's Uh, boring as always. (laughs) <laughs> well, and why is that? It is because we've got MICA, which is a, a mm-hmm. regulation for adoption and is institutional adoption, but it kills innovation in a way that futures for me are not possible to be traded in the Netherlands anywhere outside of DEXs or some sketchy exchanges, which means that if you want to attract liquidity, I think that if MICA opens up and we get uh, exchanges back with futures and stuff, that's gathering a lot more retail volume into the markets, and then you can start but, pushing the markets again. But Europeans are not speculators. It's uh, like really weird. I, I think <laughs> of, <laughs> maybe the Dutch. Maybe. But, no, but generally speaking, they don't invest in equities anymore. The mindset is they're like uh, call spread buyers and not call option buyers. Mm. So we don't see as much. I mean, if, if you go to the US, I mean, if I come here, I hear much less about crypto or stocks. Even amongst all of my friends, they 
they kind of know, but they don't care. Mm-hmm. But you go to the US, I mean, everyone shows you their bloody stock portfolio in 10 yeah. minutes. Or in Asia, they're just, you know. The Robin Hood account. On yeah, they just, you know, they, they just love speculation more. Mm. They'll come back. I mean, <laughs> Southern Europe is known for gambling. The other day I went to Valencia, my Uber driver was trading cryptos while really? driving me to the hotel. So, and then he told me that they like gambling and with the market, probably they are big or they are trading meme coins at this point. But I think not having futures in most countries is actually an issue. The, the other thing about meme coins that's just really interesting is Bitcoin now, there's such a heavy narrative. You go around it, you need to understand the history of money and, you know, blah, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 right? And meme coins is, I like the meme, number go up, right? That's so much easier and must, much less inhibiting to a 25-year-old than... It is, and, and I can understand why people get sucked into it, but also it's kind of like, isn't it, also, isn't, it, isn't it a bit too easy? Like, as in, if, if you... Oh, it's not... It, we, a, as Michael said, 99% of these... Go to zero. Go to zero immediately. Yeah. Mm. Right, and then there's a trend. So now you're just capturing an attention trend. And look, don't judge them with your kind of financial market. Well, they're all going to get blown up. They know what they're doing, which is gambling. attention is fleeting. Gambling, yeah. And I'm going to gamble how long that attention goes on for and how valuable it becomes, mm-hmm. knowing that it's not going to be persistent. Yeah, sure, Doge and Shiba Inu have been persistent, but that's it. Mm -hmm. So they know the game. Sure, sure, sure. They're internet native. They know the game, which is like, when does that mean become boring? Then you need to get out. And by the way, in the previous cycle, Dogecoin went to 100 billion. I know. So there's a lot of upside on most of them. Yeah, people don't understand that. Yeah, it's... The Dogecoin chart is a killer chart, the weekly chart of that. uh, Elon said it the other day, but Dogecoin might be a better currency than the US dollar. If you look at it from the specifications, then the, US, the Dogecoin might be better. It's not a shit coin. I think the US dollar is a shit coin. <laughs> <laughs> In my perspective. Doge, the thing about Doge, though, it's got Elon's backing, right? So, yeah, he went silent on it, though. But, yeah, but I'm saying... Yeah, the purposely. Many... Yeah, it's on Trump coin nowadays, so... No, I think the reason being is that there's only a certain number of battles Elon can take at once. Yeah. And to say, I'm going to use a globalized currency, because right now... If you want to sell something to somebody in Nigeria on the internet, it's not easy, right? And they don't have access to dollars. So if you were to use Doge as the currency, because unlike Facebook Libra, he's not launching a currency. It exists. Mm -hmm. And then we could all use Doge as payments on on Twitter. Fine. The issue is, is that's a big fight with government when you've got a platform of 500 million people and you're going to introduce a currency onto it. Mm. So I just think he, he he doesn't want to have that fight, but I still think it's going to happen. Yeah. But that's why he's chummy uh, with Trump, Trump right? Because yeah. he's chummy enough with Trump and Trump gets in, then that would be an easier fight for him, right? And, and I, I think he's being quite clever. He keeps putting out the, um, the Department of Government Efficiency. He knows what he's doing. Like, yeah, he yeah, keeps, keeps putting that out, yeah. Acronym yeah, Doge. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that and is if hilarious. I just look at it, if I just go to the chart of Doge, the weekly chart of Doge is Spike, Massive wedge for a few years, spike, massive wedge. For, and it's like this perfect thing. It's like, it's a thing of beauty, that chart. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm long doge and I'm long um, smoking chicken fish, which is my, my meme of choice. <laughs> so funny, isn't it? <laughs> Ralph, how, how is it when you, you come to London and you, you catch up with some of your old hedge fund buddies and... Yeah, you know, who's still doing like the serious stuff? <laughs> and you, you talk well, about, we, oh, we assume they are doing the serious yeah, yeah. stuff, but I bet they're not in their PA. Right? <laughs> I think what, what's interesting is most of my old mates have come across to this new world. But yeah, I'm a bit further out there, yeah. and they're like, you know, what the fuck is smoking chicken fish? I'm like, well, if you don't know that, you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> what a, what an amazing note to end it on. I think right, we've, we've been running for over an hour. But before we go, like, I, I want to know from each of you, like, what is the signal? What is the signal you are looking out for to say game on? This is happening, basically, right? Because we've been waiting for this breakout. We've been waiting for this rally for a while now, right? October's here. It's still Remember, happening. by the way, the pattern match versus last year is one for one. It was identical. So when, like, when does we've it all start? forgotten that last when year because last start? year finished really well. We're all like, yeah, last year was great. Good year, guys. We forgot that it went from March 
till October mm. in this sideways range, mm -hmm. identical. What was the date that it started rallying? It was like this week or last week. That's what I'm saying. Right. Every comparison I look at is like, come on, guys. I, I was looking as well in 2020. Um, similar period. It's yeah. election, yeah, it was a similar thing. It was and very I, similar. Yeah, and actually, I think it was... Like the end of October, we actually started and to get a rally. 2017, uh, 2016 as well. Yeah. There was a, uh, you can look at the average mining cost at this point, and we're moving beneath the average mining cost, depending on where you're at in the world, of course. 2020 had the same period. We were just moving beneath the average mining cost in 2016 as well. So the bears are currently saying we need to go to 45K, but if we go there, there the market is in serious trouble. Miners will fall out. Hash rate will probably need to go down, otherwise it's just too costly. So we need to go up. And in terms of comparison, it's just the same period. And whether or not it's going to be this week or next week or end next of November, month, yeah. yeah, whatever. I, I actually yeah. as well, everyone keeps talking to me about this 45k level. And it reminds me actually after the ETFs and we, we broke below like 40k and then everyone was talking about the 25k and like all, all this stuff and then that, that's again where I, I think there'll be pain because I, th I think people generally have almost an arrogance that oh, I'm going to pick this up at 45k and then all of a sudden we go 65 then so and then, and then the pain is actually the the chase <laughs> Look, of, of having missed it the market is in option terms short the upside you know if the market rips it creates huge FOMO because there's mm. so many people you know the people I speak to the family offices the high net worths the Institute the smaller institutions, the RIA networks, the you know all of those capital flows are basically buyers from seventy five thousand onwards, yeah, and a hundred thousand is blind panic because because that's their signal, right? Once the breakout happens, then we get in because they're not traders; they just want confirmation that the thing is trending, yeah, yeah and they'll yeah. find the narrative will fit it. Your know, price leads, narrative follows, and that will happen. So what happens is it kind of accelerates, which is why the banana zone tends to happen it accelerates through those highs mm. um, and everything gets a little bit crazy because everyone has a, a total FOMO and random friends of yours you knew from school 20 years ago start calling you up <laughs> saying, well, I hear you into crypto. That's all to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, but it is interesting because you, we, right now we're in this weird situation where equity vol is quite elevated. In fact, other asset classes, most other asset class vol is elevated. You look at most commodities, you look at equities, you look at even bonds have caught a bit of a bid. Whereas crypto vol, short day crypto vol is pretty much lows of the year right now. Well, it should yeah. do because the market's done yeah. fuck all. Yeah, so we, <laughs> well, true, but but the but you've got to look forward, right? And like implied vol is forward looking, right? And whilst we've got a little bit of a premium for the election, beyond that, you look at these levels of vol, they're not that expensive. And if, if we can Where get is the, vol now? It's kind of around 50 odd, right? Yeah. Which for crypto is not that high, right? Crypto vol, but realized vol is well, probably thirty or something. Well, no, the, in the last week, realized vol ticked up because we had that little, we had the little pop, then we had the little dip and the bounce, right? So we've actually been chopping within a range. So we've not had a breakout, but we've chopped within a range. Realized vol's ticked up, but implied just keeps getting sold because the range has held. So this is why I actually think if you are, if you are, do think the rally starts like next week, October calls are ridiculously cheap. But then, so there, here's the another December question for you. I know we we're trying to wrap, but it's just something is. Right, the the Asians are structural vol sellers in crypto. In everything. Yeah. Um, is there a large short vol position that is causing the range? We see this, you see it in FX a lot, yeah, right? You yeah. see these kind of things because somebody's got this massive... Um, if you had asked me that like a year ago, I would have said, yeah, there's this massive seller of Ethereum upside that keeps flooding the street in vol and it's preventing Ethereum from moving. And that's why we had a period, remember last year, where Bitcoin vol traded over Ethereum vol. Pre prevent because right. what? Because dealers are all on gamma, so then they Yeah, they exactly. keep the dealers kept tight, getting right? hit by overwrite, a massive overwriter in, in yeah. like more vol than they didn't know what to do with. And that just meant that their delta hedging activity meant that Contains ETFs price, couldn't really yeah. move. Yeah. And then Bitcoin, we had the narrative that ETFs are coming, ETFs are coming. So... Bitcoin started to motor and ETH just couldn't get out of the tree call that is the gamma positioning, right? But that was that was what was keeping ETH vault under Bitcoin vault for for a good few months, right? That's gone away. That that call seller got once but the what ETH about, ETF came out. But what about is there away. a large open interest in the seventy thousand calls in Bitcoin? No, I, I would say right now, 
the options trading in Bitcoin is not having a disproportionate impact on the vol. It's just there's no narrative here, right? There's no, no, okay. there's, right? I'd say I don't think the gamma positioning, because I, I used to monitor the gamma positioning quite closely, right? And, and once I realized that the size of the gamma positioning relative to the actual volume in futures and crypto spot was so minuscule, that it was really kind of irrelevant, right? Now, that may well change when we have the IBIT options and the, the options market grows, and it probably does grow a lot, right, in the next five years. But And then we start talking about S&P, where we look at S&P Gamma as the holy grail to tell us where the S&P is going to go every every third Friday of the month, right? Like, But I just don't think crypto's there yet, right. but it may be heading there. Interesting. So, so it, I guess we it feels like we potentially still on the verge of this breakout, finally, um, we all go bananas. Just one quick thing for you, Michael, because I know you're you look at the technicals quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Like, w what levels for you are you looking at in, on Bitcoin? Say that would be like a trigger for you on that. Um, I think it's just change of structure, which is already happening, but there's no momentum after that. Um, I think sixty five is the crucial level. Yeah. Um, once it breaks through that area, seventy five is probably in two or three days. That's just where the liquidity is going to be kicked out of the markets where breakout buyers are stepping in, which you guys discussed as well. So I think 65 is going to be the level. And whether it's, as I said, whether it's this week, next week, I don't really care. Yeah. I'm yeah. just positioned, so I'm fine. Long and strong. Yes, yes. Waiting, turning gray. We're That's all the still. same. We're just, yeah. we're just sit doing nothing. <laughs> you don't need to do it. The is just like, uh, I think each need to carry the altcoin markets still. Um, I think in some way, DeFi is picking up momentum. I think Aave is doing really good. So I'm trying to monitor whether there's going to be more inflow into DeFi. Um, Sui has seen some incredible momentum, of course, but nowadays we say three or four X is momentum, but back in the day, there was nothing. Um, so I'm just monitoring whether ETH picks up momentum. And I think that's going to come after the elections when there is more unrest about um, labor markets, um, rate cuts, all those things. Um, that's probably a stage where QE in terms of printing money again alongside rate cuts is going to happen and that's when we shoot off. Cool. All right, guys, you heard it from the horse's mouth. You know me and Dave have been bullish <laughs> all year, but it's not just us. Don't, don't forget to get your, um, your hoodies as well. Yeah, remember, if you want some of these beautiful hoodies, uh, it is hashtag Derabit giveaway. And we'll catch you all next week. Thanks for watching.